Okay, well, I'd like to welcome uh, everyone as they trickle into our eighth Zoom conversation. Um, we're really excited today to talk about the history of asbestos, prevention and policy efforts. Uh, how can you, how would you know if you've been exposed to asbestos? We have experts that can answer so many of your questions. We're gonna talk about legislation uh, failures and opportunities. And of course, our legal efforts where no asbestos organization has accomplished what ADO has done. And that's really thank to, thanks to Bob Sussman. All thanks to Bob Sussman. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are recording this um, and we will ask that if you come on board that you please uh, mute yourself straight away. And we ask that you turn your video off. So if somebody is doing a gallery view, they can just see our speakers. It looks like we have more people on with uh, videos. So for right now, skip it. Just let your video shine through. We'll see everybody's face. Um, we will, we, if we have time, we'll get to Q and A. Um, and that's sort of how it plays out. This is live on Facebook, which makes it really exciting that we can reach such a global audience. Uh, this is the eighth conversation. I see Mark Hendry now joining from France and so many of our other friends. And then there's folks from other countries who we've never met, uh, but we are coming together as one. I see Mark Henry in the back and all of our other um, uh, listeners are muted. So you, as, although we'd like to hear Mark speak to us in French, uh, he is muted for the purpose of this call. So what I'd like to do is start off with, of course, with, with a welcome. And I want to share a little bit about what we're gonna be doing today. So clearly this is our eighth Zoom conversation, which we're excited about uh, with Dr. Barry Castleman, Dr. Arthur Frank, Dr. Richard Lemon, and of course, Bob Sussman. And these global leaders have, have shaped uh, policy and regulations for decades. Their, their lives have been committed to public health there are no greater experts than who you'll meet on this call and within our Science Advisory Board. It is an honor to work with all of you and it is a great privilege of mine. Because of these gentlemen and others, we have accomplished the unimaginable. That being said, let's go to the next slide. To work, during this conversation, we're gonna discuss the history of asbestos, asbestos prevention efforts and regulations. It's really important. And Dr. Lemon has great knowledge about that as well. Uh, Dr. Frank will probably address the asbestos related diseases at the high risk occupations, early warning symptoms, and of course the diseases that asbestos does cause. Um, we're gonna touch on asbestos legislation, past, present and future, and talk about some of the agency failures and the big why. And then closing with ADO's legal and legislative actions and outcomes, uh, Bob Sussman and I uh, speak every day. He's an amazing environmental lawyer with experience that's off the charts. And we have accomplished some of the, some things that most people can't believe a small little independent home-based organization has accomplished. So that's sort of the program of today. If we have time, we'll do some Q and A. And if we don't, you guys know where to find us. You can read our newsletter and we can continue to move on obviously with that. Uh, we, our work is made possible by individual donors and sponsors. And these, this is the list of our 2020 sponsors. So we'd like to thank them and, and we'll name them each. Platinum sponsor is Simmons Hanley Conroy. They've been amazing. They've been helping us since 2010. Gold sponsors last year were American Federation of Teachers and Motley Rice. Silver last year, early Lucarelli, Sweeney and Meisenkoten. And of course, Omez and CAFA. Whites and Luxembourg, and bronze was a union, the International Association of Heat and Frost. And we thank all of you in the past, and we look forward to building a large group of sponsors for 2021. And we want to give our early thanks to the Simmons Hanley Conroy firm. They are the first firm to step up as 2021 sponsors. Well, we have exciting things to talk about uh, on this call, but I want to give you some new information that only you are getting this morning. Uh, Senator Tester and five amazing co-sponsors, we've introduced, thanks to them, we've introduced the 16th uh, National Asbestos Awareness Week resolution. And if Toby's on this call, she'll be excited. She's one of our, our active Twitter followers. Uh, we hope to have our resolution passed unanimously uh, by Friday so we can get to work. Uh, even if they don't pass it, which it's never happened, it's been passed uh, 15 times in the past, uh, we have a, a daily content through the entire week of April 1st to the 7th, and you will hear all about the global partnerships, WHO, so much great information that you can 
connect and share, and also tell us what you're doing to raise awareness. Um, and then lastly, this is, all, this is also new and we're excited to share. We are going to be holding our 2020 conference in 2021, September 18th. We'll pre-record our conversations with experts and air them all together as one program along with our awards presentation. So we have a lot of great stuff to share. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that you'll connect with us with our newsletter, uh, possibly through social, but don't let this conversation be the last time we all connect. So I'm gonna click off this slideshow and go straight away to the PowerPoints and or to the conversation. So I'd like to start with Dr. Lemon. We're gonna do individual introductions, self-introductions. I'd love you for to tell me who you are, what you've done, how long you've done it, and your area of expertise. Richard, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Richard Lemon, and I've been involved in asbestos research since about 1969. And most of my career has been with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and the United States Public Health Service. And uh, my early career was spent going to asbestos manufacturing and work sites throughout the United States and evaluating them for the Public Health Service. And after that, we used the information we gained to make recommendations to uh, develop standards in the United States. The first public health service study of asbestos was around 1938 by the US Public Health Service when we came out with a recommendation for a guidance limit. And it wasn't until the passage of the Occupational Safety and Health Act in 1970 that we actually started uh, setting up standards for asbestos as a regular uh, uh, thing in the United States. So we've been a little bit slow, but uh, as an introduction, uh, I'll stop there and say that I've continued my research on asbestos after I've left the Public Health Service, which I retired from as an Assistant Surgeon General of the United States and went to Emory University, which is a university in Atlanta, the city I live in, and have continued in the area of occupational and environmental health. So with that, I'll stop and let someone, uh, let the next person, I guess, Dr. Frank, introduce himself. Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Dick and Linda. My name is Arthur Frank. Uh, I'm an occupational physician that also holds a PhD degree in uh, the study of asbestos uh, as it affects uh, respiratory tissue. Uh, my uh, beginnings uh, in the world of asbestos go back to 1968 when I was a first year medical student and began working with Dr. Irving Selikoff at Mount Sinai, where I was a medical student at the time. Uh, I've done my training at Mount Sinai, uh, uh, worked at the National Cancer Institute, and have been an academic physician uh, all of my life. Uh, currently, I'm a professor of medicine and a professor of public health at Drexel University uh, in Philadelphia. And my work uh, in the area of asbestos has uh, resulted in over 100 publications and uh, work literally uh, around the world uh, having done work and in, in published from parts of Asia, including Mongolia, China, uh, Sri Lanka, India. Uh, currently, I have some active projects also ongoing in South America, particularly in uh, Colombia, uh, but have done work in Brazil and Argentina as well, uh, and have been uh, affiliated with ADAO ever since uh, Linda grabbed me over a plate of sushi at a conference in Japan in 2004 uh, and asked if I would uh, work with ADAO, which she was getting uh, started in those days. Uh, and I had the honor and privilege uh, to actually meet her husband uh, as well. Uh, so there's, there's uh, a bittersweet but very fond memories that go back a long ways. And uh, I'll be happy to try to... Uh, later discuss any uh, issues that I can bring some light to. Thank you. And I guess Barry is probably the next one to go. Hi, I'm Barry Castleman. Uh, my 
The training is in occupational and environmental health uh, and in, in engineering. I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, a master's in environmental engineering, a doctorate in public health. And my interest in asbestos started in uh, uh, 1970, 1971, when I was writing my master's thesis about the health effects of asbestos. After that, I worked with environmental groups in Washington, and we uh, attempted to get asbestos banned in a number of products and uh, started with re regulation through various uh, U.S. government agencies. Around that time, I noticed that uh, the pressures of regulation and liability appeared to be driving hazardous industries, including the asbestos industry, into other countries. And so I started investigating the flight of hazardous industries to developing countries. Um, and I have spent uh, the last 50 years continuing to uh, work on, on that. Uh, I, I wrote my doctoral thesis about the public health and corporate history of asbestos, uh, largely uh, aided by my involvement in litigation in the United States, where I was starting to see and continuing to see corporate documents reflecting the internal knowledge of companies that were being sued for product liability, premises owner liability. And uh, uh, it's remarkable the consistency of the corporate documents in showing the uh, strictly bottom line mentality of the companies in deciding how to deal with uh, the problem of asbestos as a health hazard before the era of regulation in the 1970s, and then uh, dealing with uh, government regulation and bad press starting in the 1970s, uh, well, really a little before that. So uh, that's just sort of a, a background. Uh, I work with people all over the world uh, today and have for many years trying to uh, deal with the problem of asbestos in countries where it's less regulated than, than it is in Northern Europe and in the United States. Thank you, Barry. Bob, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, this is Bob Sussman. I am uh, a lawyer by training, uh, graduated from Yale Law School in 1973. Uh, I have had a, a varied and, and I think interesting career uh, since law school, uh, working on many different sides of issues for uh, many different clients. My, my focus has been uh, product regulation and environmental uh, protection. Uh, I work for industry at uh, two large Washington law firms uh, for much of my career. Uh, but in 1993, I was appointed by President Clinton to be the deputy administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency and served as the number two person at the agency uh, for two years. Um, I returned to the agency at the beginning of the Obama administration uh, as senior policy counsel to administrator Lisa Jackson. And uh, I was there for four and a half years, and uh, my portfolio was a broad one. It was uh, basically uh, to stay on top of important policy issues uh, across the agency that were of interest to the administrator uh, and help her uh, manage those issues from legal and, and regulatory and, uh, and political uh, perspective. Uh, after leaving EPA, I've, I've had two gigs at, at law schools, uh, both Georgetown Law and uh, Yale Law, teaching uh, environmental policy and, uh, and regulation. And, and over the last uh, six years, I have been representing uh, NGOs, environmental and, and public health groups on uh, chemical contamination and pollution and uh, product issues, uh, largely under the uh, under the Toxic Substances Control Act. So when it when it comes to uh, asbestos, until recently, I was the average uh, legal bear. I, I I knew that asbestos was. 
uh, an important issue, and I had a general sense of where it was going. Uh, but over the last four years, uh, I have immersed myself in asbestos as uh, counsel to, uh, to ADAO, uh, and that's given me the opportunity to rub shoulders with uh, really knowledgeable experts like Richard and, and Arthur uh, and, and Barry. And, and if anything is, is, is clear to me, uh, it's, it's that asbestos uh, needs to be addressed uh, on multiple fronts. It's of course a scientific and medical issue, uh, but it's also a huge public policy issue uh, maybe one of the biggest public policy and legal issues uh, that the country has faced in the sphere of, uh, of regulation and, uh, and public health uh, protection. So I'm, I'm still on a learning curve here and uh, uh, I hope to continue on the learning curve, but it's, it's, it's a privilege to be here uh, and to share with you uh, what I have learned about this very important issue in my uh, five years on the job. Thank you, Bob. And for those of, of you who I haven't personally met, I am Linda Reinstein, the co-founder of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. We are a 501c3, a nonprofit. We do not make legal referrals. And we have earned ourselves a seat at the table. By being an independent organization, we have been able to provide testimony to Congress, work with other countries on policy and prevention, but more importantly, have impact in the United States. As a widow, Arthur, Richard, Barry knew my husband and so did Perry. They knew my husband, Alan, when he was diagnosed with mesothelioma, which is an incurable aggressive cancer. That is not the only disease asbestos causes. Dr. Frank will talk more about that. But that, as a result of Alan's diagnosis, I learned that asbestos hadn't been banned. I'm embarrassed to tell you, like many of you, I thought our air, water, and soil was free of contaminants. I was wrong. Alan fought a hard three-year battle and died with our then 13-year-old daughter by his side. I only share that because I am not the only widow or widower or family member that have suffered loss and pain from this. And Barry and I would probably agree this is one of the biggest corporate crimes ever committed. Um, and my intern, I see Sarah's on here. She's a brand new intern from USC and she came on board because she also learned asbestos has been banned and how this impacts disadvantaged communities. It is a human rights violation. Sure. Uh, there's, there's a list of atrocities that asbestos has caused and pain and suffering. So we, ADO, have been at the forefront, earned a seat at the table. We've done resolutions. We have worked with members of Congress to draft uh, legislation. And we've also opposed bills that would impact or harm asbestos victims. So we take our work very seriously and we're the only organization that has the mission of education, advocacy and community to prevent exposure to eliminate all asbestos caused diseases. And I see Mark Hendry's face in my top side who in France. So collectively, we as public health advocates have really rallied a cry of prevention, but also responsibility and accountability. So let's get started. I remember uh, in 2004, Barry, I don't know if you'll remember, Doug Larkin and I walked to meet you at the train station uh, in Washington, DC, and you had your beret on. I didn't know exactly who who you were, or what, how our paths would cross, but I knew you were the leading expert that wrote the book, actually sort of like the Bible, of the legal and medical aspects of asbestos. When, Bob, when, when Doug and I met you, you were sort of skeptical of a new organization, and I know you, you kind of thought like, what are we going to accomplish? With, with that first friendship, you gave me your book. I went home reading it. I could have pressed flowers with it. It's so thick and heavy, uh, and I learned the hard way about some of the things that you, Richard, Arthur and Bob have known about the criminality of asbestos. Would you share briefly with our audience, when I speak at law schools, people like, and like Sarah are intern, people want to know what is asbestos, where can you find it, and why do we still have this ongoing problem? So not to speculate, you're an expert witness. Tell us a little bit about the history of asbestos and where we are today. Sure, my involvement with this uh... Uh, developed over time uh, uh, after I'd been interested in the problem of asbestos for uh, almost a decade and working with environmental groups. 
I was approached by lawyers who explained product liability and asked me to start doing research on the history of knowledge about asbestos and disease. So I wound up writing a doctoral thesis at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health about the, the public health history of asbestos. And in the meantime, the lawyers were providing me with these documents that they were getting in legal discovery. And what the documents showed was that uh, long before there was uh, uh, any EPA or OSHA, uh, the companies knew about the dangers of asbestos going back to the 1930s. Uh, there was a substantial awareness about this in the industry. There were actually a lot of damage suits and workers' compensation claims. This was the subject of a great deal of discussion at the different types of industry organizations uh, that uh, left behind records of this, publicly available records. And the, the corporate documents which have come in legal discovery have been uh, most illuminating in showing uh, what was the response of the companies. And uh, the response was very consistently uh, to try and minimize the cost to, to these companies. They uh, uh, did very little to, uh, practically nothing to warn and protect their employees from the uh, lethal dangers of asbestos. Uh, they uh, occasionally had to pay or fight workers' compensation claims, but uh, uh, the, the internal corporate documents show a longstanding knowledge of the major companies in the asbestos business, not only the asbestos industry, but the oil industry, it was uh, their company doctors in their discussions were writing about asbestos as a cause of cancer multiple times in the late 1940s. The railroads knew about asbestos in the 1930s. Their company doctors documented that that kind of uh, awareness of the, the danger and the means of, uh, of reducing that danger, including education of the worker, none of which apparently was actually authorized by uh, the uh, managements of the railroads. Uh, the, the, the corporate documents showed that even though there were company doctors and industrial hygienists that were well aware of the dangers and uh, the, the importance of uh, at least warning the workers about the insidious dangers of this uh, dust, which had no warning properties of its own, uh, uh, the, 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 the decisions about telling the workers and uh, providing any form of protection to the workers was a corporate management decision. The company docs and the company industrial hygienists were just hired help as far as the people running the companies were concerned. And uh, they, uh, they also understood that their job was not to uh, come up with new ways for the company to spend money on uh, uh, costs that weren't going to bring back 15% or more in profits uh, as a return on investment. So, uh, this is the, the education, if you will, that the corporate documents provided and which I have uh, I published in my doctoral thesis and then in four subsequent editions of my book on the public health and corporate history of asbestos in which uh, many of the corporate documents are cited. Thank you, Barry. And Barry has written uh, the, the leading book on the legal and medical aspects. And I would encourage you to, uh, we'll write a post blog after this call, put some resources in so people can read papers and books and other things, because there's a lot of information. There's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Barry, I was pretty angry when Alan first got diagnosed. I really thought that we were protected with our laws. And I learned the hard way we're not, and that we have to have a legislative and legal strategy to try to protect public health. I want to talk to Dick Lemon about prevention and pol uh, prevention efforts and policy. Dick, with your history at NIOSH and what you've done in the last 40 years, tell us a little bit about, I know you shared some about NIOSH when you first began, but why didn't the regulations actually do what we thought they might have? I know we've made progress, but we prob probably could have done more. Share a little bit about prevention and regulations, please. Richard, can't hear you. The first, I think I mentioned the first study that was done by the Public Health Service was done in 1938 uh, by a team led by Dr. Dreesen. And in that, they studied the health effects of asbestos and now as a result, came up with a recommended uh, uh, guidance limit for use in the workplace. And it was at 5 million particles per cubic foot. Now that may not mean a lot to many people, but <clears throat> that's a weight standard 
and it measures all dust that's in the workplace. It wasn't very effective in reducing uh, disease in the workplace, but it did set for the first time a guidance for industry to follow. Uh, then for the next probably 30 years, not very much was done on the study of asbestos. Uh, there were a few studies, but nothing uh, dealing with uh, changing that recommended guidance limit. So during the 1960s, when uh, President Johnson was president, he introduced a law to, or introduced a law to uh, uh, be the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which would bring together a group uh, uh, to enforce and promulgate standards for occupational safety and health in the United States. Well, it was unsuccessful under his term and did not pass the Congress. But in <clears throat> the next term uh, that President Nixon was president, it did pass the Congress. And in 1930, uh, in 1970, in December 31st, 1970, he signed this law into effect. And I might add that the um, use of asbestos was growing during the 19, after World War II, 1950s and 60s being used in a lot of different products, uh, particularly heavily used in construction and in textiles. And uh, the um, law was brought about a lot by the testimony of Dr. Irving Selikoff that Dr. Frank mentioned earlier, who testified before Congress how workers were still dying of diseases that they should not be dying of. But anyhow, the Occupational Safety and Health Act was passed in 1970 and went into effect in April of 1971. And as a result of that, the very first criteria document and recommendation for a standard was on asbestos because the NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health that was created by that law, felt that was the most important occupational issue to address. OSHA passed as their first standard, a standard on asbestos based upon the recommendations out of the NIOSH criteria document. And at this time, it was uh, for a standard of five fibers per cc. And this was an actual count of fibers. It didn't necessarily identify them as asbestos, but it counted them as fibers. And NIOSH had recommended two. But to move forward, in 1976, we at NIOSH found that the data on which we made our first recommendation was flawed. And it was the data out of the British Occupational Hygiene Society. So we made a new recommendation and we became, so far as I know, the first agency in the United States to recommend a ban on asbestos in the workplace and a total ban on asbestos in the workplace. And uh, we reduced our standard recommendation down to 0.1 fiber per cc, which was the lowest concentration that could be measured adequately and accurately with the phase contrast microscope. And that recommendation stayed in effect until the 1980s. And, but in the early, uh, late 1970s and 80s, the EPA did go forward and try to ban asbestos uh, across the board, not just in the workplace, but in, in, in uh, the environmental setting. Unfortunately, that ban was unsuccessful because of legal challenges, and thus there was never a, uh, a ban on asbestos in the United States. But uh, the OSHA finally decided to reduce their standard down to the um, 0.2 fiber per cc in the 1980s, and um, by 1994, OSHA went down to what NIOSH had recommended of 0.1, but in none of that did we get asbestos banned in the workplace. So uh, we've had an assorted <laughs> of uh, banning asbestos and reducing it. But I will say that reducing our 
concentrations down to 0.1 had forced many of the industry to reduce the use of asbestos and the use of asbestos in the United States as a result started going down. However, what we now are faced with is the fact that asbestos is still in commercial products, it's still coming in in commercial products and is a legacy. And that means that it's still to be found in old construction such as buildings and other um, things such as ships and many other products. So it's the legacy asbestos that we have a major problem with today. And that's something that the asbestos ban bill, the Allen Reinstein asbestos ban bill that we're working on with the Congress this year is um, trying to address is the legacy asbestos. And I'm sure Bob may get into that in a little bit more detail. And I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll stop at this point in time. And, and uh, if, if you wanna take questions, we can take a couple right now about uh, that if you want to. Let, let's wait, Richard. And if we have time, we'll circle back, definitely. Um, I wanna, and that was excellent. I think everyone needs to know the history behind asbestos and what NIOSH <clears throat> did do. And more importantly, we're 50 years away from some of these new regulations. Nixon, President Nixon declared a war on cancer in the 70s and 50 years later, industry is still able to import and use asbestos because we in the United States don't have a ban. I think the government re regulations are really important, but the companies have to know about them and more importantly, follow them. And what we see is it's not just workers who are uh, impacted by asbestos, it's often, as you know so well, Richard, it's their family, it's that deadly hug, um, and it's environmental exposure from climate change issues where structures that are contaminated from legacy are imploded or need to be repaired. Dr. Frank, let's talk about uh, high-risk occupations, early warning symptoms, and asbestos-related diseases. When oh. Alan got sick and had a slight persistent cough, it took us two years to get, to get a diagnosis of mesothelioma. Tell us with your great experience and knowledge a little bit about those three. Sure. Uh, before I do though, I wanna compliment my colleagues. Uh, I've known Barry and, and Richard for, for literally for decades and very much uh, admire their work. It's from Barry's book that I learned uh, uh, about an infamous memo that I quoted just this morning in a deposition. I do uh, a fair amount of medical legal work for injured parties as well. And, it's the infamous Vanderveer Brown uh, memo from the 1930s when uh, Johns Manville was sort of caught with their hand in the cookie jar about uh, uh, having their workers die. And he said, well, uh, workers are uh, having a good living working for us and now they can have a good death uh, in terms of what uh, uh, Richard was talking about. We know that these diseases are preventable and it's a shame that uh, they're not prevented uh, and uh, we're still fighting that fight uh, these many decades later. Uh, but we should know that it's, it's through the uh, efforts of, of people like Linda and Barry and others that 60 countries in the world have now uh, banned asbestos. And uh, we just happen to be a laggard in that respect here in the United States. With regard to where people get exposed, first of all, people need to uh, understand that uh, in its heyday, there were three, four, maybe even 5,000 products that contained asbestos. I see Tony Rich is on the meeting with us today, and he's got the most marvelous collection of all the kinds of products in which asbestos was found. Um, and there are certain occupations in which asbestos at the workplace was particularly prominent. Uh, and that would be shipbuilding, where some of the highest levels ever have been uh, described. Um, uh, when, when Richard was talking about the 5 million particles or five, uh, uh, the number of particles per cc and measurements up, you know, around a thousand fibers per cc have been found in shipyard settings. The group with the highest ongoing regular exposure, uh, along with uh, many shipyard workers, would have been asbestos insulators, but literally everyone in the uh, construction trades, electricians, carpenters, pipe fitters, plumbers, uh, sheet metal workers, I could go on and on, would all have been exposed. Uh, there are a million people in the United States that do uh, mechanical work on cars and trucks. 
And that's another industry setting in which there is a, an enormous amount of exposure. On the other hand, because information was not shared uh, by companies and in the settings in which people work, people like Alan and many others were exposed. Uh, uh, products that were not only used in construction were also used by individuals without any knowledge of the hazard, things like joint compound, which contained asbestos up until the 1970s and a very common source of exposure. But there are odd exposures that people have no knowledge about that I, in my fairly long career, have run across. Uh, I got a call one day from an attorney and he says, I've got a case I bet you've never seen. Uh, I've got a man who drilled bowling balls. Bowling balls are uh, hard plastic that also have asbestos in them. Um, and uh, he says, I've got such a case. And I said, well, that'll be my second. Uh, and within a couple of months, I actually had my third with that as a major source of exposure. Uh, there were these enormous numbers of products that contained asbestos. And in terms of a legacy, things like vermiculite that was mined here in the United States, 80% uh, of the world's vermiculite came from a mine in Montana that ended up in somewhere between 10 and 30 million addicts that contain asbestos and other uh, potentially dangerous fibers. The diseases that one gets uh, can be characterized into two groups. Uh, and again, I'm sure everybody knows, but asbestos is a natural uh, or a, a set of naturally occurring minerals. They're in two groups, the serpentine form, chrysotile being the one member, 95% of the world's asbestos has been uh, serpentine and the other 5% are the amphiboles, particularly chrysidolite and amosite. Uh, the others not being so important commercially. Um, the diseases break down into two groups as well, the non-malignant diseases, the major one being asbestosis, which is a scarring of the lung tissue or scarring of the lining around the lung, uh, the pleura. And it falls into a family of many similar diseases. The better known ones would be black lung from coal dust, silicosis and other uh, such diseases. What makes asbestos not exactly unique, but really quite remarkable, since silica can also cause lung cancer, is that asbestos exposure causes a wide variety of cancers. Uh, best known, of course, would be mesothelioma, which is a, fortunately a rare because universally fatal disease, but it causes far more lung cancers. It also causes ovarian cancer in women, laryngeal cancer, and there's lots of evidence about uh, causing oropharyngeal cancers, uh, even tongue cancers have been reported uh, in the scientific literature from Canadian chrysotile miners in excess, uh, gastrointestinal cancers, esophagus, stomach, colorectal cancers, even duodenal cancers, which are quite rare, kidney cancer. Uh, so uh, it's a very dangerous carcinogen. Uh, the other thing that is striking about asbestos is how little it takes. We have both animal and human data that as little as one day of exposure, literally one day of exposure, has given rise in animals and humans to mesotheliomas, lung cancers, one day of exposure in a week or less, giving rise to lung cancer in humans. The other cancers have not been uh, so well studied. Uh, so it is a, a dangerous, toxic, hazardous materials that Fortunately, 60 countries or more now in the world have gotten rid of, and we continue the fight to try to get rid of it here. Uh, and that uh, some of us uh, that are on this call uh, have engaged in the medical legal aspects to try to bring some justice to people who were uh, truly uh, inappropriately uh, exposed to a preventable uh, problem that uh, gave rise to many thousands of people with disease estimated to 230,000 in the world and 40,000 deaths a year uh, here in the United States. So that's at least a very brief overview of the hazards. And you can find asbestos, obviously, in many places that are well known, but one needs to be concerned about other exposures that are less well appreciated as well. So thanks.
Thank you, Dr. Frank. And as a physician, um, I really rely on you to help us when patients are newly diagnosed because we really urge them to seek care from a, a center of excellence because there aren't enough institutions that treat those patients with mesothelioma and good care can change the outcome of someone's diagnosis or at least improve the treatment. Um, before we go to asbestos legislation and agency failures, uh, Barry's back, that's a good thing because I wanted to talk to Barry. Uh, I think it was 2008 and you couldn't make it to the APHA conference. And you asked me to stand in for you and there's, try, try to wear those really big shoes and make a presentation. And I said, what would you like to call it? And you said, that's the catching up to Croatia act. And you were talking about how other countries had banned asbestos and you and Arthur do so much work internationally. Share a little bit about where the US is obviously lagging greatly. Tell us a little bit about the in international face of asbestos bans. How many countries, what do they go through? Are they effective? Share a little bit, Barry. Well, the, uh, the bans on asbestos were really led by Sweden, uh, pressing Saab, Volvo and Scania to substitute asbestos in brake linings in cars and trucks. This was the, the, the hardest uh, substitution among the major asbestos product users. And so this happened in the early 80s and the bans began in the Scandinavian countries uh, on all uses of asbestos. Uh, and then uh, spread to uh, uh, Italy and Germany in the early 90s and then France uh, when France banned asbestos in 1996, uh, this provoked uh, the Canadians to go to the World Trade Organization to challenge the French ban. And uh, the, the uh, European Union won that case for France. And yeah. this authorized, in effect, uh, other countries to go ahead and ban asbestos. And so the bans have now uh, developed all of the countries that, had, that, that were joining the European Union after 2005 had to have a, a ban on asbestos in place. And uh, uh, today there are over 60 countries where asbestos has been banned. Uh, these are all over the world in uh, Africa and Asia and Latin America, <clears throat> as well as North America and Europe. Uh, the Canadians, which were leading asbestos uh, producers uh, when they took that case to the World Trade Organization, uh, a little more than 10 years later, banned uh, or stopped mining asbestos in 2011 and then banned it in 2018. And so uh, this was why I would nickname the asbestos ban laws in the United States the Catch Up to Croatia Act, because we were really so far behind so many other countries in doing this. In the United States, asbestos was effectively banned by liability and litigation. Uh, the prohibitive cost of uh, selling products containing asbestos and, and being sued by people who got hurt by these products uh, forced uh, the companies to stop using it. Uh, this in addition to the government regulations of EPA and OSHA. And so finally, the uh, use of asbestos in manufacturing uh, has uh, uh, stopped in the United States within the last 10 years and the only use of asbestos, uh, it's not used in any manufactured products, but it is used in the chlorine industry in one of the processes where uh, an old industrial process for making chlorine uh, still persists in the United States. And our efforts uh, banning asbestos are to try and get the chlorine industry to uh, uh, change over to uh, uh, more efficient technologies, which uh, do in fact pay for themselves within four years uh, of uh, conversion. Th thanks, Barry. And when, when people hear uh, about the chlorine industry, they are the sole importer of raw asbestos in the United States or the, are the, are the pr primary. We know some textiles come in contaminated, so I shouldn't speak in absolutes. Uh, our data isn't as good as it, sh it should be. But last year in 2020, one industry imported over 300 metric tons of asbestos for, to produce uh, industrial chlorine and caustic soda. 
and there are safer alternatives as Dr. Castleman just mentioned. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lemon talked about the agency failures, how the EPA tried to ban asbestos and it was overturned by basically a, a process challenge. They definitely have more money than ADAO has. We fight a hard fight as the, as the underdog, but we are winning. And I wanna shift to uh, legal and, and legislative strategies. It was abundantly clear after President Obama signed in 2016 the Tosca reform bill into law. It was called the Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act, which Bob and I worked on with, our, with many of our colleagues. We were so excited. We thought, okay, we were the poster child asbestos for the need to reform Tosca. We were excited. I literally heard what city went next to my daughter, President Obama, talk about how EPA couldn't do it. Let's sign this law and let's get it done. We were like tearfully excited. Well, an election came about that November and, and not to be political, but it has been political. Trump's administration has really set our work back by four years. Um, so we're gonna talk about the legal legisla legislative strategies. I realized during Trump's administration before I met Bob that we're gonna to have to find another path. We'd always been asking Senator Boxer's office, who's actually importing asbestos and where's it being used? We have the right to know. And I said, we can go to Whole Foods and figure out where the organic food is and where if we wanna pay a little bit less, we can buy food that's non-organic, but it's labeled, it's marked and consumers can't vote in a ballot box or uh, with their dollars when it comes to asbestos necessarily. Necessarily. So it took Bob Sussman, who, who wears angel wings in my world, to, to, to really challenge the EPA on this. So let's talk, Bob, a little bit about the Alan Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act of 2019. There have been, since we did our first resolution, I counted up, I think there's eight ban bills that have been introduced since 2005. Eight. And we don't have any, anything done. We've made great progress, thanks to you and many others. Let's talk about where we finished off in 2019 and where we're going in 2021 legislatively. And then let's touch on legal, because I think that's where we kick some major big uh, patootie is in a courtroom because of your brilliant uh, legal skills. And I'm so honored to work with you. So shed a little light on all that, Bob. Yeah, let me, uh, let me first start uh, 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 saying a little more about uh, Tosca, the Toxic Substances Control Act, and uh, picking up where where Linda uh, left off. Uh, Tosca is uh, maybe not a law that everybody knows about, but but it's a very important one, and it's 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 the basic uh, federal statute that governs the use of chemicals and products and, and manufacturing uh, and, and in the environment. And it was under Tosca that in 1989, EPA proposed uh, to ban uh, virtually all the major uh, uses of asbestos. Uh, but EPA's rule, as, as was mentioned, uh, was uh, successfully challenged in the courts uh, by industry. And the, the end result was that uh, the US did not have uh, an asbestos ban for many, many years. And uh, that, that issue came to the fore when in 2016, uh, Congress did a major overhaul of, of Tosca, recognizing uh, that the law was not doing the job of protecting people from chemicals uh, that it was originally expected to do. And as Linda mentioned, at the center of the debate about reforming Tosca was the example of asbestos. Uh, and uh, as, as President Obama said when he signed the new law, a law that can't ban asbestos is not a law that's doing its job. And therefore there was an expectation following enactment of the new law that we would be on a path uh, to do in, in, uh, uh, in the late uh, uh, 2010s what EPA had tried to do in 1989 and, and failed at and, and that would be uh, uh, first, a risk evaluation determining that the ongoing uses of asbestos uh, do in fact present a significant and unreasonable risk, uh, followed by an EPA rule that would ban all ongoing uses of asbestos. 
Well, the sad truth is that the path since 2016 has been a very bumpy one. Uh, the Trump administration has not met the challenge of asbestos uh, the way many of us hoped. Uh, there have been setbacks and, uh, and disappointments. Uh, and, and among those uh, uh, are two that, uh, that led us to seek relief from the courts. And I wanna, I wanna mention them. Uh, the first is that EPA interpreted TOSCA uh, so that it did not apply to legacy asbestos. This is uh, the discontinued asbestos products that uh, you find in all kinds of structures uh, across the country, schools, uh, factories, apartment buildings, stores, public buildings. Uh, and, and so forth. And so EPA took the position that it had no authority to uh, address and reduce the risks of, of legacy asbestos. So uh, we, along with other groups, went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and in 2019, uh, we were successful in getting that court to, uh, to rule that, that EPA does in fact uh, have responsibility for addressing legacy asbestos under TOSCA uh, and had to step up and evaluate uh, legacy asbestos uh, uses at exposure. And so uh, EPA at this point in time belatedly is beginning the process uh, of evaluating the risks of legacy asbestos and I, I can't say that we're tremendously op optimistic about where that will end up, but at least there is in a process in, in place to try to get our arms around the extent of the risk uh, to the population from all this in situ asbestos to which uh, millions of people are exposed. Um, the other thing that happened is uh, we realized that Yes, EPA was conducting uh, an evaluation of the risks of ongoing asbestos uses, but in reality, uh, inf information, EPA had very little information about how much asbestos is coming into the country. We know about the asbestos uh, uh, in raw form that goes to the chloralkali industry, but what we don't know about uh, is the amount of asbestos that is contained in products. Uh, we don't have a good handle on what those products are. Uh, we don't know how much asbestos they contain. Uh, we don't know where those products go. We don't know how many people are exposed to these products. Uh, we don't have a good handle on how they are used. And it was, it was our perspective that EPA could not do a good risk evaluation uh, without that information. Uh, we petitioned EPA uh, to require reporting by industry on all uh, asbestos containing products coming into the country, uh, where those products went, how much asbestos they contained, uh, and so forth. And, and EPA turned us down flat. They said that uh, they, they didn't really need that information. They knew as much as they needed to know, and uh, they weren't about to require industry to submit reports. And so uh, we went to court again, and we were able to persuade uh, a federal judge in, in California uh, that EPA should in fact have required uh, reporting on asbestos, and the judge uh, ordered EPA to use its authority under TOSCA uh, to require reporting. So we're, we're, we're still fighting with the government, but we have uh, a very strong uh, court opinion, which makes it very clear that EPA is on the hook uh, to require reporting under TOSCA on asbestos. Now, to turn to the legislative situation, um, 
I, I think what Linda said before is, is, is critical, and I, I think all of the speakers uh, firmly believe this. Uh, yes, we're, we're rooting for EPA to get the job done under Tosca, and, and yes, we feel a little better that uh, the Biden administration is not in charge of, of EPA, uh, but there are no guarantees here, and uh, the road to ban asbestos under Tosca uh, remains a difficult one, potentially a long one, uh, and a road that can land us back in the courtroom uh, and put us where we were in 1989, where EPA uh, adopted a ban on asbestos and the courts uh, threw it out. So um, if we put all our marbles uh, uh, on the table of an EPA ban, uh, we're at risk that we will come up empty handed. And that's where legislation is so important because Congress can do in a stroke of the pen uh, what EPA has not been able to do uh, since 1989 and may not be able to do uh, even now. And so legislation is truly uh, the silver bullet that uh, if, if written properly, if, if, uh, 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 if passed quickly, uh, can put an immediate end uh, to the importation and use of uh, asbestos in the United States. So uh, we, we made a lot of progress in the last Congress. We saw a lot of bipartisan support. Um, we thought we had a good solid bill. Uh, at the end of the day, however, it, it did not pay us. But I think as Linda can explain, uh, uh, we are once again moving down the road in the new Congress and uh, we are once again pushing for asbestos uh, ban legislation. And we have a lot of support from many, many different stakeholders and a lot of interest on the Hill. So uh, uh, now is the time uh, to, uh, to push for legislation. And uh, I, I, I truly hope that this push uh, is gonna be just a little better than the push in the last Congress and is finally gonna get the ball across the finish line. Well, Bob, thank you for that detailed explanation. Of course, your, your legal work. Before we uh, run around the panel and ask what's your message to Congress, a, a few things. Uh, we are going to start Global Asbestos Awareness Week on April 1st. For those of you, and I'm seeing stories of people who have suffered here, share your story, share our content, please get connected. Um, thanks to the generous sponsorship of the Simmons Hanley Conroy firm, we are going to offer scholarships to those individuals on this Zoom call to attend our virtual conference as our guests, thanks to the Simmons Hanley Conroy firm. So thank you, Perry, for supporting our work. Uh, education uh, is empowering, and we believe that everyone should know the dangers of asbestos and how to prevent exposure. Um, as far as the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act, like Bob said, it is alive and well. We, with Bob, uh, work to write the most comprehensive ban. It doesn't only just prevent imports and use. It required uh, a legacy study of asbestos and structures. It required chemical companies to report like they should. And it also includes two fibers, if anybody's from Libby, Montana, windchide and richterite, which can be found in attic insulation, et cetera, in about 15 to 30 million homes, we don't really know. So there's a lot of elements to the bill. It's far more than just banning asbestos, but we would be happy with that too. Um, so we want you to stay connected. There's a lot of experts here. And lastly, there are going to be more Zoom calls. There will be one uh, with Tony Rich and probably Perry Browder and, and Mark Henry in the future. So stay tuned, get our newsletter. Um, before we go around, I would really like um, our four speakers to give your message to Congress. We have a resolution that was introduced yesterday. It gives us a week of awareness and urges the Surgeon General to issue a warning, not a statement, but a warning. But what's your message to the ban asbestos champions and sponsors and supporter? Let's start with Richard. Message to Congress? My message to Congress is that I hope you'll stand up and 
take notice that asbestos is being banned around the world, but the United States is not doing so, that it's far past time that we ban asbestos. And I hope that you will stand firm in your conviction to ban asbestos this year. Thank you, Dr. Lemon. Dr. Frank? I just want to echo Barry's comment. Let's catch up to Croatia. Fair. Dr. Castleman, message to Congress. You're muted, Barry. I, I believe that the, uh, now of course we need a ban on asbestos in the United States, but we also need to have uh, enforcement in the form of surveillance of imports to assure that uh, things like uh, brake pads and engine gaskets, which are being imported, are, 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 do not contain asbestos. Once the ban is in place, it needs to be enforced by, uh, by, by appropriate surveillance of imported products to assure compliance with the ban. Excellent. Robert Sussman? Yeah, my main message for Congress is, is don't think that asbestos is yesterday's problem and you don't need to worry about it because uh, we have 40,000 deaths a year uh, attributable to asbestos. That number is not going down, uh, may even be going up a little bit. And, and so this is a current uh, urgent problem that, that we need to pay attention to today. Excellent. My parting message to Congress would be one life lost to a preventable asbestos caused disease is tragic. Hundreds of thousands is unconscionable. It's time to act enough ban asbestos. With that, I can promise you that Sarah, who will be working with me, our wonderful new intern on Thursday, we will write a wrap up, send you some papers and information that our speakers might have referenced, and more importantly, invite you to stay connected and stay tuned for our conference. And Perry Browder, do you have a message to Congress? I'm just asking you to unmute. Yes, this is the time to get it done. We have a two year window before all the elections happen. So I think we can do it this time. Good luck. Thank you, Perry. Thank you for your support. Uh, in my town of LA and Hollywood, we call this a wrap. I wanna thank Richard, Arthur, Barry, Bob, and all of the attendees for joining us today. I hope you found this to be informative. I hope it supercharges you to connect and share with us and help us to get it done because we do need to catch up to Croatia, as Dr. Castleman says. This concludes our program. Thank you so much.